Welcome everyone to South Carolina Educational Television's live coverage of the 2003 inaugural address. I'm Katherine Reynolds and with me is Dr. Walter Edgar, South Carolina historian and host of Walter Edgar's Journal on South Carolina Educational Radio. We're here today on the south side of the State House grounds where in just one hour, Mark Sanford will become the state's 115th governor. And it's a cool, clear day. Unlike many inaugurations in the past, Catherine, where it has really been bitterly cold. And what we're seeing on this on the um, screen right now is video from today's prayer service. It was the first of the many events today on of the inaugural events, and that is a tradition for many governors. Yes. Many governors have held their ceremonies at Trinity Cathedral and uh, at First Baptist Church here in Columbia. Now we will go to the top of the step State House steps where the procession is about to begin. And now, presenting the honorable members of the General Assembly. Sometimes, most of the time. Yeah. The distinguished members of the House of Representatives are led by the Sergeant at Arms carrying the mace followed by the Clerk of the House, Sandra McKinney, and Speaker of the House, David H. Wilkins. There are 124 members of the House and 46 senators. In the Senate right now, we're min missing one senator, is that correct? That's correct, since Andre Bauer resigned. But that whole procession headed by the Mace Catherine dates back to the 18th century when our Colonial Commons House of Assembly purchased that mace as a symbol of authority. And uh, the number 124 representatives, people might wonder, we've had that for more than 200 years since our 1790 Constitution. Now, what is the significance of the sword? The sword used to be used by the Royal Council. Again, it's a colonial uh, symbol. This particular one is a replacement for one that was stolen uh, earlier in the 20th century. And the Senate, of course, as the more deliberative body, is a descendant of the Royal Council. We are looking at a House and a Senate controlled by Republicans. And for the first time in a long time, the, well, the governor's office, not for the first time in a long time, will be a Republican. But for the first time in a long time, all bodies, plus the governor's office, will be controlled by Republicans. Significantly, historically, what is the significance of that? Well, from 1877 until 1974, the Democrats were in total control of all aspects of state government, the governor and both houses, uh, until uh, Jim Edwards became the first Republican governor since Reconstruction. Uh, this is the first time the Republicans have held control of the Senate, the House, and the governorship since the 1870s. But having one party in control of state government is not new to South Carolina. Let's talk a little bit about David Wilkins. Okay. I believe we are looking right now at still members of the House coming out. And David Wilkins, he's 56 years old. He is Speaker of the House. Yes, and he's he will shortly become one of the longest serving speakers, but he's still got uh, a decade or two to go to beat the Honorable Solomon Block from Barnwell County, who served as Speaker of the House longer than anybody not just in our history, but in any legislature in the United States. Now with the 
Bennett, Glenn McConnell will be leading them. Right now we're still looking at members of the House. Glenn McConnell, he is a Republican from Charleston. He is President Pro Tem President of the Pro Senate. Of the Senate and a master of the intricate rules of the South Carolina Senate. If you don't know those rules, you, or if you do know those rules, you can get legislation stopped or passed. It's very, very crucial in the legislative process. You were telling me a very interesting story about how he mastered those rules. As, as a young senator, he tape recorded the rules of the Senate and driving back and forth between Charleston and Columbia, he listened to them and he almost literally memorized them. And so there's not much that comes up either in committee or on the floor of the Senate that he does not have a Senate rule to apply. The distinguished members of the Senate are led by the Sergeant at Arms carrying the sword. Senate, Jeffrey S. Gossett, and President Pro Tempore of that body, the Honorable Glenn F. McConnell. So now we are actually seeing the members of the, the Senate walk down the steps. And as we just talked about, Glenn McConnell was leading them. And, and of course it's a smaller body, 46 members, or 45 now since Andre Bauer resigned. Uh, but for most of our history as a state, we only had 35 senators. Now why, how did, what happened with the change there? Beginning with, uh, under the Constitution of 1895 that Ben Tillman wrote, uh, he made it possible to create more counties and so he got his friends their own counties and then their own Senate seats. So we went from 35 to 46 counties uh, in a very rapid period at the turn of the last century. The Senate has only recently um, become controlled by the Republicans. Right, that happened at the beginning of the last of the last session. It's in 2001. When Senator Vern Smith from uh, Greenville switched parties, and uh, that caused quite a change. I mean, literally, people who had been in power. Of course, the Senate was not organized along partisan lines prior to that. It was organized strictly by seniority. But that meant that, for the most part, that Democrats who had been there for a long time, particularly from the smaller rural counties control the key chairmanships. Now the South Carolina Supreme Court 
represented by the Chief Justice, Jean Hafer Toll, and Associate Justices, James E. Moore, John H. Waller, Jr., E.C. Burnett III, and Costa M. Placonis. members of the South Carolina Congressional Delegation, representing the 1st Congressional District, Congressman Henry Brown and Mrs. Brown. Representing the 2nd Congressional District, Congressman Joe Wilson and Mrs. Wilson. <laughs> Representing the 3rd Congressional District, Congressman Gresham Barrett and Mrs. Barrett. John Spratt. And representing the 6th Congressional District, Congressman Jim Clyburn. Representing the 4th Congressional District, Congressman Jim DeMint. It is our pleasure to also have with us today both of our state's U.S. Senators, Senator Fritz Holling and Senator Lindsey Graham. <laughs> it is a privilege to now introduce you some very distinguished guests and dignitaries joining our ceremony today. U.S. Senator John McCain of Arizona. U.S. Congressman Charlie Norwood of Georgia. And from Tennessee, Zachary Womp. Congressman Dr. Tom Coburn of Oklahoma and Steve Largent of Oklahoma. And now representing the White House. Tucker Eskew, 
Deputy Assistant to the President. to present to you the former ambassador to Korea, Richard L. Walker. The former ambassador to the court of St. James, Phil Later and Mrs. Later. the city of Columbia, Mayor Robert D. Coble and Mrs. Coble. to have with us today representatives of these foreign countries with business investments in South Carolina. The Minister for the People's Republic of China, Li Jun Lan. The British Consul General, Stephen Collier. The Consul General of Nigeria, Joe Keshi. The Consul General of France, René Serge Marty. Also representing France, an honorary consulate, Philippe Gerard Felsenhardt. The Consul General of the Federal Republic of Germany, Hans Jorg Brunner. The Consul General of Japan, George Heseda. The Consul General of the Republic of Korea. I'm Catherine Reynolds here with Dr. Walter Edgar, and we're with South Carolina Educational Television. And Dr. Edgar, when did international investment really start taking place here in South Carolina? It, it really began in the 1950s, and it's appropriate that the British Consul General is here because the Bowater plant in York County was one of the first major foreign investments. But it took off in the 1960s, and of course a lot of locals up country refer to I-85 as the Audubon. Now, do you think it's typical for us to see this many dignitaries at an inaugural? 
I don't think is typical, but then the foreign investment in South Carolina is not typical. We lead the nation in foreign investment. In fact, we really make it a nice climate for businesses to settle here in South Carolina. And that's been a theme of state government really since the Burns administration. He actually sent a pamphlet out saying, we welcome business, we are friendly to business. Before we saw these um, international dignitaries, we saw Senator John McCain and some other congressmen, and those people are here because they were invited by the Sanford folks. They, they, were, friend, they were friends of uh, Governor Sanford, and of course, uh, during the presidential primary, Governor-elect Sanford was uh, very actively involved in Senator McCain's presidential candidacy. We also started talking about how we are on the south side of the State House grounds, but the inaugurals have not always been on the south side. They used to be on the north side. They used to be on the north side, and they usually were preceded by a parade down Main Street, and the governor would get out of a car or earlier a carriage and then walk to the stand on, a, on the north steps to take the oath of office. Now, why do you think they switched it from the south? When did that happen? And why do you think they switched it from the north to the south side? Richard Riley was the first governor to have his inauguration on the south side. And given as nippy as it is this morning, it must be for the, for the warmth, because frankly, we've got the sun here, and the north side of the state house is totally in shadow. And we also have, it looks like a good attendance here, but probably not as good as Jimmy Burns had. Well, Jimmy Burns had 100,000 people spread all over most of downtown Columbia. That's the largest crowd ever for an inauguration. In now, the, what year was that? That was in 1953. And you said you were surprised oh, excuse by... Me, excuse me, 19, yeah, 1951. Excuse me, 1951. And the Consul of South Korea. And now, ladies and gentlemen, these former governors of the great state of South Carolina. The Honorable Robert Evander McNair and Mrs. McNair. The Honorable James Burroughs Edwards and Mrs. Edwards. Richard Wilson Riley and Mrs. Riley. The Honorable Carol Ashmore Campbell, Jr. and Mrs. Campbell. Honorable David Mo 
Muldrow Beasley and Mrs. Beasley. We now present the chairman of the inaugural committee, Mr. and Mrs. John Stringer Rainey. of the Institution of Higher Learning in our state. I'm Katherine Reynolds with Dr. Walter Edgar, and we are interrupting our regular programming right now on South Carolina educational television and radio to bring you this special coverage, inaugural coverage. We're here on the south side the State House grounds where it is a, I would call it a beautiful day. It's a little chilly. But it's, it's beautiful and sunny and earlier accounts in the 20th century talked about lowering skies and bitter northerly winds and we fortunately do not have that today. No, it is a little windy. It's a little, it's a little bit windy. Um, but there are a lot of things going on today, Catherine. There uh, are. Started off with the prayer service, which is, we know it was at Trinity Episcopal Cathedral where other governors have had theirs. But in earlier days, there used to be a parade down Main Street. And they would march right up to the right, north side. Right up to the, door, to the front steps and the governor would get out of a carriage and then go take the oath of office and give his speech. You told me that the carriage was not always led by horses. No, uh, when Olin D. Johnson was inaugurated, the carriage was pulled by mules. Wouldn't that be a sight to see coming down Main Street? Well, sort of <laughs> South Carolina. <laughs> True. I mean, after all, Abbeville County used to produce more mules. That was the mule market capital of the world back when mules were still a mainstay of Southern agriculture. So today we had the prayer service and then we're having the actual swearing in and then that is followed, followed by a, 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 a meeting greet. A, a meeting greet reception at the, st at the uh, governor's mansion, uh, which other governors have done. When Again, Olin D. Johnson in the 1930s when he was inaugurated, uh, he and uh, his wife Gladys uh, shook hands with any and all comers who would drop by the state house, which was pretty unusual because before that most uh, things were pretty private, relatively small. Uh, in fact, we think of inaugural galas, and that didn't happen until Strom Thurmond. He had the first inaugural ball, and they held it in the State House. So that really was not even a big affair then. Well, there is not going to be an inaugural ball tonight, is there? No, there's not. There's going to be a barbecue with at least 14 different kinds of barbecue. Uh, our four barbecue regions of the state will be adequately represented. And, and that's a big deal to a lot of people here in South Carolina. Oh, absolutely. You can get into a fight. And uh, as we know from our radio show, when you talk about barbecue, you can get in real trouble because ours is better than North Carolina's. <laughs> the Adjutant General, Major General Stanley Spears and Mrs. Spears. The State Superintendent of Education, the Honorable Inez Moore Tenenbaum, and Mr. Tenenbaum. The Controller General-Elect, the Honorable Richard Ekstrom and Mrs. Ekstrom. Controller General, the Honorable James Albert Lander and Mrs. Lander. The Attorney General elect, the Honorable Henry Dargan McMaster and Mrs. McMaster. The Attorney General, the Honorable Charles Maloney Condon and his wife, Dr. Emily Condon.
the state treasurer, the Honorable Grady Leslie Patterson, Jr. and Mrs. Patterson. The Secretary of State-Elect, the Honorable Mark Hammond and Mrs. Hammond. And now, the wife of the Lieutenant Governor, Bet Carter Peeler. Ladies and gentlemen, we present the children of the governor-elect, his sons, Master Marshal Clement Sanford III, Master John Landon Sanford, Master Bolton Chisholm Sanford, Master Blake Christian Sanford, and please welcome the wife of the governor-elect, Jennifer Sullivan Sanford. of the governor, Rachel Gardner Hodges. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Lieutenant Governor of the State of South Carolina, the Honorable Robert Lee Peeler. the Lieutenant Governor-elect, Andre Bauer. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please greet the Governor of the great state of South Carolina, His Excellency James Hovis Hodges. And the governor-elect of the great state of South Carolina, the Honorable Marshal Clement Sanford, Jr. Mark Sanford, Dr. Edgar, is a graduate of Furman University here in South Carolina. Yes, and that explains partially the Furman choir and band have played very prominent roles here. And uh, among the, the very fine faculty he studied with was A.B. Huff. And uh, Governor Lex Sanford did a study of Kusaw Farm where he grew up. Uh, yes, and you mentioned the Furman band. They, that's who we do hear, what we do hear in the background, music yes. by the Furman band. We believe it's the Coronation March. It, that, and they've also interspersed with some hymns. They've been playing some hymns. Uh, so it's, it's Now, very... Governor Hodges is a graduate of USC. Yes, sir. yes. Sir. And, uh, and USC Law and School as well. The presiding officer for this inaugural ceremony. The President pro tempore of the Senate, the Honorable Glenn F. McConnell. Thank you, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen of South Carolina. Welcome to the inauguration of the 115th governor of the state of South Carolina and for the inauguration of the lieutenant governor and the constitutional officers. We have come to celebrate the orderly transfer of power that is one of the great traditions of our country. It symbolizes the continued rebirth of our government from old to new. They are the phoenix of the new, administration rising from the ashes of the old. We celebrate our tradition by serving as witnesses at this inauguration, reveling in a system where the will of the people of South Carolina can be affected not by arms, but by hands at the ballot box, 
We understand that our government is not based on any person or group of persons, but in a system that was designed by our founding fathers to protect against abuse. It is a system symbolized by those here in attendance, representatives of each branch of government, executive, legislative, and judicial, who are charged with serving as checks on each of the others. We must strive to not only do good, but to prevent tyranny by any branch of government. That is the genius of our system that we celebrate on this occasion. Today, we also say goodbye and hello with equal affection and fervor. We welcome two new members to the executive branch of governor, Governor Mark Sanford and Lieutenant Governor Andre Bauer, and to all of our state's constitutional officers. Although they did not receive unanimous votes to get here, as no elected official has, they will assume a solemn responsibility to serve each and every citizen of this state. The man who comes forth today to assume the position of governor has the requisite desire and the ability to accept this heavy burden. During his tenure in Congress, he was a man steeped in convictions and untroubled by political expediency. He always did what he thought was best for our country, no matter what. This conviction to do what is right reflects his outstanding personal qualities. He is a man of integrity and faith, and he has long shown that true leadership comes from adhering to one's beliefs and never wavering from them. This has always given him an unmitigated desire to serve the best interest of his constituents and his country, no matter the political consequences. It will serve him well as he leads our state into the future. Our new governor comes to office in very difficult times. There are many serious issues that will need to be addressed in the days, months, and the years ahead. However daunting as the task may seem, he can take solace in the fact that those that welcome him today will be working with him tomorrow to make our state a better state and the tomorrows of our children better than their todays. We also come today to inaugurate a new lieutenant governor and constitutional officers. As we stand in the shadow of the statue there of the consummate public servant, Strom Thurmond, who gave his career to serving the people of South Carolina and to witness the historic transfer of power in our state, let us all pay attention to the oaths that each of us take and reaffirm in our mind why we all sought public office as well as the duty we owe those who have entrusted us with the honor and the responsibility. Each of us here should pause and reflect upon the tremendous responsibility that has been placed on every shoulder here. We have been bestowed with a trust by the citizens of South Carolina that we act in the public interest and that we act ethically and ably in the discharge of our respective offices. Let us heed the words of Henry Clay who stated that government is a trust and the offices of government are trustees. And both the trust and the trustees are created for the benefit of the people. The people who elected us also expect us to work together in addressing the future of South Carolina. While we may disagree, let not our disagreements make us disagreeable. If possible, let us search for common ground. The problems that face our state are not partisan, and their solutions need not be partisan. If we ardently strive for this approach, then we can best represent the will of the people and respond to the needs of all South Carolinians whose desire for a better future has brought us here today. Let us lead this celebration unified in our efforts and guided by God's will to do the work we must do. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please stand as the Reverend Joseph A. Darby, pastor of Morris Brown AME Church in Charleston, delivers the invocation. Let us pray. Gracious, merciful, and omnipotent creator, we give you thanks for the blessing of this day when a new page is turned in the history of our state. We thank you for the beauty of the day. We thank you for innumerable blessings. We thank you for the blessing of democracy. And we thank you for bringing us safely to this present hour. Bless this occasion as we gather on the actual birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Grant that the spirit of equity, justice, restoration, and understanding espoused by Dr. King will guide us this and every day. 
bless our new governor, who faces considerable challenges as the new leader of our state. Grant him wisdom and grant him courage for the facing of this hour and for the living of these days. Be with his family, be with the Lieutenant Governor and his family, and with all who will share in the leadership of the state, that they will do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you. Bless all of those charged with the awesome responsibility of holding office in a representative democracy, so that they will do not what is partisan, popular, or politically convenient, but that which is right for all people. Bless our world, bless our nation, bless our state, bless our several communities. Empower us to celebrate the diversity of our unity and the unity of our diversity. Open our eyes so that we can secure the future of all of our neighbors and not turn a blind eye to those in need and those plagued by chronic difficulties. Be with us and guide us so that at the end of each day, the words of your prophet Amos will come to pass so that justice will roll on like a river so that righteousness will flow like a never failing stream. And so that when all is said and done, we can look to you and give you the glory for the great things you have done. Enable us from our various cultural and political perspectives to give new political meaning to the words of the song of our ancestors in faith. When all of God's children get together, what a time, what a time, what a time. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing as we present the color guard for today's services. Members of South Carolina's Military College, the Citadel. Today, Dr. Egger, when Mark Sanford is sworn into office, he will be using a Bible that was a gift to him by, we're told, a very special friend. It is inscribed. It is a tradition for governors to use Bibles that have a unique meaning. Yes, and I, two of them come to mind, Catherine. One is when Governor Edwards was inaugurated, he had his Edwards family Bible, but he inserted in it a New Testament his mother had given him so that each of his children could have a, a special Bible from that occasion. And probably the, the, the best one story is from when Olin D. Johnson, who was a World War I veteran, he carried with him throughout the Meuse Argonne Offensive as a doughboy uh, a, a testament, a New Testament that his uncle had sent him. And he carried, brought that tattered New Testament with him to take the oath of office. It adds a nice touch to the event. And I think it's uh, South Carolinians have always had that special affection for family. And most of these are, are family Bibles. There's, there's a family connection, or in this case, a very close friend. Uh, so it's not just an official act. It's a, it's a personal family commitment as well as a commitment to the state. We were talking earlier about the barbecue that will be held later tonight. Mm -hmm. And we've heard some people say that this is the first barbecue ever, an inaugural barbecue. And that's not true. It's always a great privilege for us to be able, on occasions such as this, to show our respect, our love, our honor to our great country and to our flag. Please join with me now in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and just for all. Thank you very much. Now, please join in the singing of the national anthem led by former New York Metropolitan Opera singer Sarah Reese of Anderson School District 4.
please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, the oath of office will be administered to the Lieutenant Governor-elect, the Honorable Andre Bauer, by the President Pro Tempore of the Senate, Glenn F. McConnell. Would the family of Andre Bauer please come forward? Place your uh, left hand on the Bible, raise your right hand, and repeat after me. I do solemnly swear. I do solemnly swear. That I am duly qualified. That I am duly qualified. According to the Constitution of this state. According to the Constitution of this state. To exercise the duties. To exercise the duties. Of the office to which I have been elected. Of the office to which I have been elected. And that I will. And that I will. To the best of my ability to the best of my ability. Discharge the duties thereof. Discharge the duties thereof. And preserve. And preserve. Protect. Protect. And defend. And defend. The Constitution of this state. The Constitution of this state. And of the United States. And of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you your new Lieutenant Governor, Andre Bauer. Thank you. Congratulations. Yes, sir. Is your waiting? The Lieutenant Governor will now administer the oath of office to the state officers and state officers elect. I would ask that these individuals please rise and approach the podium. The Commissioner of Agriculture elect, Charles Ray Sharp. The Adjutant General, Major General Stanhope Sifford Spears. State Superintendent of Education, Inez Moore Tenenbaum. Comptroller General elect, Richard Ekstrom. Attorney General elect, Henry Dargan McMaster. State Treasurer, Grady Leslie Patterson Jr. Secretary of State elect, Mark Hammond. For you to all raise your right hand, I would ask that you respond appropriately at the end of the administration of the oath. Do you solemnly swear that you are duly qualified according to the Constitution of this state to exercise the duties to the office of which you have been elected and that you will, to the best of your ability, discharge the duties thereof and preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of this state and of the United States. So help you God. I do. I do. Congratulations. I look forward to working with you. It is our pleasure now to present to you a patriotic medley arranged by Sarah Reese and sung by Sarah Reese and Philip Boykin. Philip is a Greenville native and former honor student of the South Carolina Governor's School for the Arts. They are accompanied by Dr. Linda LeBluel of Clemson University.
accompanied by Nancy Smith. Oh, yeah. 
And now, ladies and gentlemen, Marjorie Wentworth of Sullivan's Island reciting her original composition, Rivers of Wind. At the beginning of this poem, I mentioned the Kusa. This is the name of the river that runs through the land where Mark Sanford comes from. It is a place that is filled with meaning for Mark and for his family. Rivers of Wind. Today the angels are tumbling down through heaven's door. All along the Kusa, they hover in a misting halo until the black river shreds into the sea. Today, as the old oak leaves spin into bright bunches of confetti, oysters split open their shells and sing. At the water's edge, lilies and tick seed bloom white and yellow candles for the dead. All along the Kusa, the breaths of angels compose the air, moving in rivers of wind across this land. The rivers are omnipotent. They weave through the earth like veins moving for thousands of miles. There is no beginning. There is no end. Like the moss and trillium flowing across the forest floor, or the ravens gathered above the sharp edges of the Blue Ridge escarpment, in the gray granite cliffs where they build their winter nests of twigs and fine hair, the birds caw and chortle. Their rumble is the sound of a wild, free place. From these mountaintops, it seems you can see forever from the sand hills to the swampland, from the Piedmont to the PD, in all directions today, the ever-changing colors are splashing through the sky. Because in every heart, there is a god of hope hiding like a tight, frightened seed that waits for the first smudge of sunlight to spread across the horizon and later in the purpled evening rain. Seeds of hope are waiting in the sacred soil beneath our feet and in the light and in the shadows spinning below the hemlocks. Hope waits in the endless waterfalls tumbling toward earth, transforming into rivers that pull us through embattled centuries. Hope waits for the waters to still and the currents to empty themselves of the blood that came before. Hope waits for a day like today. Hope waits for a man like this man who reaches across our divided lives. Be still, be silent. There is so much light filling the sky here, so much conviction in the wind now, Watch the seeds of hope as they scatter far, far across this land. And now for your pleasure, the South Carolina State Concert Choir under the direction of Dr. Richard Beckford singing Let Me Fly, followed by America the Beautiful, performed by the Furman Singers, the South Carolina Governor's School for the Arts and Humanities Chamber at All School Choirs, and the Furman University Symphonic Band. Thank 
Ladies and gentlemen, the oath of office will be administered to Governor-elect Marshall Clement Sanford, Jr. by the Chief Justice of the South Carolina Supreme Court, the Honorable Jean Hafer Toll. Governor Lex Sanford. There you go, Mom. Complications. That's a, no, there's no complication. If you'll place your left hand on the Bible and raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Marshall Clement Sanford Jr. I, Marshall Clement Sanford Jr. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I am duly qualified. That I am duly qualified. According to the Constitution of this state. According to the Constitution of this state. To exercise the duties of the office. To exercise the duties of the office. Of Governor of South Carolina. Of Governor of South Carolina. And that I will. And, I, and that I will. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability, discharge the duties thereof. Discharge the duties thereof, 
and preserve, protect, and defend. And preserve, protect, and defend. The Constitution of this state. The Constitution of this state. And of the United States. And of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. I hereby declare the Honorable Mark Clement Sanford, Jr., duly installed as Governor of South Carolina. On behalf of the people of the state, I wish you Godspeed. Thank you. Edgar, with that, Mark Sanford becomes the 115th governor. 115th governor, dating back to 1670. We have a long tradition in South Carolina. It's ironically also the 115th General Assembly. That'll never happen again in history to have the coincidence. I, uh, thank you very much for that, uh, that kind welcome. I don't know exactly what to say. It's interesting, uh, former Governor Beasley, just moments ago, after both Sarah Reese and Philip Boykin had uh, made their magnificent presentations, uh, said, now you got to follow that. So I, I don't know where to begin. <laughs> Um, other than, th again, thank you for that warm welcome. I really appreciate it. I would say that um, when I look across the sea of different faces, there are so many of you who work so hard to make this day possible. So I guess I would be begin by simply saying thank you. I'd, uh, in going through the process of thank you, begin with family. I guess that's no great accomplishment since they were kin and they had to help out. but. Uh, Nonetheless, I would say thank you to my wife, Jenny, and to and to our four boys, Marshall and Landon and Bolton and Blake, and to, uh, uh, and to her folks and our folks, which I mean, to her folks and my folks, which makes them our folks, um, to extended family, thank you as well. I would say to friends old and new, when I look across, I see a lot of friends. Some of us have known each other for years. Some of us have known each other just for a little while. Some of us have, have never met. But everybody was united in a theme of change. And so some friend sent emails off to, to friends. Some talked to folks at church. Others talked to ch uh, folks at work. But the net result of all those conversations is what's happened today. And I'd say thank you for that. I would say that Jenny and I are humbled by what's happened, and it's my goal to honor the trust that each one of you have, has placed in me and in, the, in this new administration. I would say to, uh, to members of Congress, I have some dear friends that are here. Uh, I look back and I see Zach Wall from Tennessee and Charlie Norwood from Georgia, Tom Coburn and Steve Largen from Oklahoma. Um, they came from a long way away to be here. I would say as well to the now junior senator of South Carolina, my dear friend Lindsey Graham, and to the rest of the South Carolina delegation, and uh, to war hero and U.S. Senator and friend John McCain, to all the members of Congress, thank you for honoring us with your presence here today. I would say... I would say to Governor Hodges and his wife Rachel, we appreciate you being here, and we appreciate your years of service to this state. I would as well say to the long list of governors, going back to former Governor Hollings up to Governor Beasley, thank you for your respective years of service to our state. I uh, would say to the legislative body that's gathered here, I look forward to forming collaborative working relationships with each one of you. I admire the way that you all care about our state. And I would say particular thanks to some of your leadership who have been so kind during the transition process itself. I finally want to recognize the promise that comes with each one of the newly sworn in constitutional officers, because in all of our respective hands, and I'm not leaving you out, Judge Toll, with the judiciary, all of our respective hands comes the promise of change. But before I get into that, let me say this. I have always been leery of inaugural speeches. The notion that somebody in politics could stand up and suggest that with the sweep of a hand a new day is here, a new dawn has begun, just to me sounded phony. And uh, yet here I am, 
one who believes in change at an inaugural. So I'll simply say this. It is phony to suggest that with the sweep of a hand, things will change. And it's for that reason that I have always loved the story of the, the Antarctic explorer, Sir Ernest Shackleton. He and 29 fellow sailors found themselves trapped in the ice pack off the Antarctic continent in what developed into a two-year struggle for survival in which none of them should have survived. They survived on a diet of seal and penguin and the dogs of their own dog team. They tried to walk out to Paulette Island. They basically rowed up to Elephant Island. They took a little lifeboat and took a month and sailed down to South Georgia Island. They climbed a mountain range. And at the end of two years, all 29 men were safely reunited back at South Georgia Island. And I think in the end, they survived because they stayed true to what they knew in the beginning, and that was that the only way out was with each other. And it was through collective effort and focused vision and persistence and sacrifice and bold steps that they changed from being in a situation none of them should have survived to a situation wherein every one of them did. I think that in that same light just 30 years ago, when Colonel Hal Moore and his men from the 7th Cavalry landed at LZ X-Ray in the Idrang Valley in what was to have been a routine patrol, they instead found themselves as the first engagement between North Vietnamese regulars and American soldiers. And men of that unit, like First Sergeant Larry Galrath from Belton. Gentlemen, if you would stand. First Sergeant Larry Galrath from Belton. Corporal. Ray Tanner from Johns Island, Command Sergeant Southern, Command Sergeant Major Southern Hewitt from Florence, honor us with their presence here today. I think that each of you are the backbone to what makes our state and our country great. I believe that each one of you all are heroes. I think that you men and others like you in uniform set a shining example as to what real sacrifice and honor ought to be about for each of my four sons and for each of one of us here gathered today. And I appreciate you all being here. I um, would say, or I would guess, that Sergeant Hewitt would also tell you that they found themselves in a situation none of them should have survived, but that most did, because once again, they stayed true to what they knew in the beginning. And that was that the only way out was with each other, and that it was through collective effort and focused vision and persistence and sacrifice and bold steps that they changed from being in a situation none should have survived. The change was needed to Shackleton, and more was obvious. And yet, I think that any objective look at our state would lead you to the same conclusion. When per capita income in South Carolina is 81% the U.S. average, and some people literally have to leave our state to pursue their economic dreams, change is needed. When you have a $5 billion budget that's essentially a billion dollars out of, out of balance, change is needed. When almost a third of the students that begin the educational process in South Carolina don't make it through high school, change is needed. In the book Red Hills and Cotton, South Carolina, South Carolina tenant farmer described his difficult decision to leave the land for the factory at the turn of the last century. He said simply, I want to improve my condition. I want to educate my children. I want them to have things better than I have had. And I think that those few words express the hopes and dreams of every parent of every generation. And in our state, it's crucial that we give every parent the opportunity to fulfill that desire. And to do so, we got to recognize that there's a transformation taking place in the world economy that is as real as the one from farm to factory at the turn of the last century. Our country is becoming increasingly high tech and knowledge based. And the question is, will we be prepared for this change? I think we can be if we recognize that this new direction involves an understanding 
the taxing and spending policies and economic development and education and quality of life are not separate disciplines, but an interrelated foundation upon which our future rises or falls. And I think that the ultimate question is, how do we forge this new direction? And I would again once, to say, uh, once again say through collective effort and focused vision and persistence and sacrifice and bold steps. You know, I'd say there's one little extra to that. And that is by staying true to what Moore and Shackleton knew and what each one of us know. And I think what was recognized by the late Dr. Martin Luther King, and that is that the only way forward, indeed the only way out, is with each other. And I think it's imperative that everyone in our state be given a chance to grab the economic ladder and to begin to climb it. And to do this, we've got to be a state of economic opportunity. Those opportunities can only come our way if we make the changes that prepare us for the national transformation that is, that is indeed headed our way. So let's use this inaugural day to reaffirm our collective values that make this state special and unique. Let's renew our commitment to friends and to family, the communities that we live in, the futures that our, our children will inherit, and the transcendent faith that I think governs our civility. But most of all, let's draft a contract that looks to the future. It's Ecclesiastes that says that where there's no vision, the people perish. And in these perilous budget times, government cannot be all things to all people. It's very important that we more carefully define our priorities as a state. Let's sign a contract wherein I commit to trying to earn the trust of every South Carolinian, not just those of my party or those who voted for me. Let's sign a contract that asks more of each South Carolinian if we're going to be a state of opportunity, I think we as well have to be a state of responsibility. So if we want better health care, can we begin with what we eat? If we want better education, can we begin by checking the homework of our children? Most of all, let's commit to a plan that involves those bold, sometimes small, but always meaningful steps that bring about change. A plan that reexamines the way that we think and the way that we do things. I know that mine won't be the only plan, but I'm committed to it, I believe in it, I campaigned on it, and I'm going to push hard for it. I said from the beginning of this campaign that I thought that there were a couple of different building blocks that were key to raising incomes and the futures of every South Carolinian. They are one. We've got to look at getting the economic engine of South Carolina going on all eight cylinders. There are many things that we can do on this front. One would be just to very aggressively focus on job creation and investment the way that, for instance, Carol Campbell did. He did an outstanding job on that front, and I would like to follow in his shoes on that particular front. There have been a number of other governors that has, have as well focused on economic development. But I'd say you can, you can go many steps further, and I'd use one uh, example simply being tax policy. We've got to have tax policies that are tied to sustainable economic growth, not just of large industries, but of small businesses, which are the real backbone to job creation in South Carolina. They've got to, they've got to reflect our determination to make South Carolina a haven for entrepreneurs with good ideas. And while some will say that we can't cut taxes in this sort of budget crisis, I would say that if we don't make fundamental changes to our tax system, we'll never put our state on the kind of economic footing that is so essential to keeping it home to all of our grandchildren. Two, we've got to look at the way we educate. Throughout the years, South Carolinians have come together on the need to improve schools. We've made remarkable strides on accountability, thanks to much of the work of former Governor Beasley and, and, and the legislature. We made remarkable strides on teacher pay and other areas. We will not retreat from this commitment. But I think we got to do more. My good friend Jim Miles used to say, and I suspect he still does say, that if you keep on doing what you've been doing, you're going to keep on getting what you've been getting. And I think he's right. 
I believe we got to redouble our efforts to make certain that every dollar that enters the educational system actually makes its way down to the front line of the battlefield in education, which is a teacher in a classroom. I also think that we need more choices in public education. And, and let me just touch on this, this choice issue alone. On, on the choice issue alone, many students in our state can compete with students anywhere in the world, anywhere in the country. But other students, through no fault of their own, cannot. And it was President George Bush who said, we cannot leave a child behind. If we're really honest, we all know that there are children being left behind in South Carolina. Parents with meager means have the same aspirations, the same hopes, the same dreams for their children as other parents. Children from poor families have the same needs as other children. I know we will all stand fast to improving public education. I will. I know Inez will. I know the House and the Senate will. I know the voters of South Carolina will. But I simply ask that we go one step further by insisting that parents with children in failing schools be given more options because I think it's the right thing to do and it in no way compromises our commitment to public education. <laughs> Thirdly, I think we've got to look at higher education. We will never have the resources to be all things to all people. And I think that frankly in some ways there's something wrong with the system that forces colleges and universities to go out and hire lobbyists to compete for funding. If you look at the numbers, I mean, there are many employers in South Carolina who still cannot get the kind of workforce needs out there in the marketplace. It was the governor's own workforce task force, of, I guess 2001, that said 61% of the businesses in South Carolina couldn't get the kind of skills that they in many cases needed. And I think that research universities and teaching universities and tech schools can all be part of the formula to change in this, but we do need more focused roles, better coordination, less duplication, better responsiveness to the workforce needs of this state. I'm committed, well, let me say it in reverse. I will say that I'm open to how this might be done. I'm committed that it will be done. I, um, fourthly, would say let's visit restructuring. I think that a key to many of the ideas I talked about in the campaign and to what I'm talking about right now is, is continuing with what Carol Campbell began in 1993. He understood the need for fundamental stru structural reform in state government. As he put it, horse and buggy government just wouldn't carry you through in the space age. And I think that he also said that there would come another time wherein we'd need more restructuring. I think that that time has come. My administration, through every cabinet level, will go out and look at formulas and look at policies and look at ideas that would help to raise income levels for every South Carolinian. But as we all know, there are many agencies and boards and commissions that are outside the purview of the governor's office. And I think that further restructuring can further enhance efficiencies, save money, and speed reform, and I'm committed to working with the General Assembly toward this end. Can I uh, say just one word to the thousands of state employees who are out there who ultimately will have to make any of our policies work? And that is, as we ask you to serve the people of South Carolina, we need to keep faith with you by both recognizing and rewarding your hard work. I would also say that while there's some state employees in the back, the, uh, I would also say that while we're on the, the topic of restructuring, I have a sentiment that I would bet is shared with nearly every South Carolinian out there. And that is that restructuring was one of just many historical accomplishments of former Governor Carol Campbell. I think that his decision saved lives during Hurricane Hugo. His decision sped rebuilding in its aftermath. He kept the state together with many of his decisions during lost trust. I think that so much of what he did is still felt today, whether that's in jobs created or things like the, the School of Science and Mathematics. And so, Carol, 
I just want to thank you and Iris for what you've done for our state. And I, at a personal level, if you all would stand, in fact, uh, the, uh, I would uh, as well say, Carol and Iris, thank you for the many personal kindnesses that you've shown to me and to Jenny and to our four boys. We very much appreciate it. Five, let's not lose sight of quality of life. For some, it means quality health care. For others, it means uh, an adequately funded law enforcement. For others, it means a transportation system that works. All these are parts of quality of life. But I think that one of the keys to attracting participants in the technology transformation that is around us and approaching our state is lies in just not losing sight of this state's physical beauty. I think that there's a real pride of place that exists in South Carolina, and it has yielded us a tremendous point of business advantage in the way that we look and feel as a state, and I think it's very important that we not lose that. Each one of these five building blocks, I think, are keys to keeping South Carolina home. And as we embark on this course, let me give you three guiding principles that will indeed guide this administration. First, people will get straight talk. I won't try and sugarcoat problems or sweep them under the rug. I'll lay them out as best I know how, and I'll leave it at that. And I'd say the first challenge before us will be the budget. It's a gargantuan problem, and I'm going to struggle through it with the, the, with the General Assembly. I'd say, two, this government exists to serve and not be served. If you believe, as I do, that not my strength or your strength, but God brought us to this day, then there's a certain humility that goes with trying to fulfill his purpose in this day. I, I believe in the concept of servant leadership. My dear friend Steve Largent, who's back over here, who was kind enough to visit us from Oklahoma, is the person from whom I learned this concept. He's the embodiment of the concept. He walks it every single day. And I think it's incredibly important. And what I'm going to ask is that everybody in my administration, the inner members of my team, hold this perspective for a whole number of different reasons, the least of which is that it's insurance against the greatest form of lost in government and that is lost sight of who the boss is, the taxpayer. Third, as best I know how, I intend to be the governor of every South Carolinian. I don't have all the answers for the issues that divide us, but on this, the, the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King, I pledge to be open, to reach out, and to listen because no political party, no group, no person has the market cornered on wisdom. And let me say finally that by taking bold steps in the right direction, Shackleton and his men not only survived what were memorialized in the book Shackleton, the epic story of survival, Colonel Hal Moore and his men, three of whom were kind enough to gather us here, be with us here today, not only survived, but were as well memorialized in the book and then later the movie, we were soldiers once and young. And the question for every one of us today is how will the actions we take today be remembered tomorrow? I think that if we take the right steps, some of which I outlined today, some of which I talked about in this campaign, we can have a remarkable impact in South Carolina's future. Let's pledge ourselves to beginning that process today because, among other reasons, Jenny and I were at the funeral a few weeks ago of one of South Carolina's great visionaries, Charles Frazier. He was buried underneath the Liberty Oak there at Harbor Town, and there underneath that giant oak, I heard the words of the South Carolina historian Charles Joyner, who in surveying the state of the state since the 60s said this, some say there's been no progress, but they've forgotten where we started. Some would stop here, for they cannot see how far we still have to go. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege to inherit 
a place and time so many others have worked so hard to create. It's a responsibility to build upon the foundation they have laid, and with God's help, we'll do just that. Thank you. Dr. Egger, I have that Governor Sanford was interrupted 15 times with applause. 24-minute speech, and uh, so it's about well, almost applause every minute. And uh, he laid out some pretty radical uh, ideas for South Carolina, things that we need to do to change. The South Carolina Governor's School for the Arts and Humanities Chamber and All School Choirs and the Furman University Symphonic Band. The audience is invited to participate as directed. Please remain standing for the benediction to be delivered by the Reverend Det Bowers of Christ Church of Irmo. Receive now the benediction of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think, according to the power that is invested in us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, both now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. The inaugural recession will now begin. 
led by His Excellency the Governor of South Carolina, along with Mrs. Sanford and their family. With that, we have a new governor. Mark Sanford becomes the state's 115th governor. Of course, as we have been talking about today, this does not end the inaugural events. We had to, earlier today the prayer service, then the inaugural address, and then later today from 2 until 4, I believe, we have a meet and greet at the governor's mansion, and people can come and meet the governor and his wife and family. And then later that evening, this evening, beginning at 6 o'clock, 6 until 10, we have the inaugural barbecue at the Watermelon Shed at the State Farmer's Market, and tickets are available at the door. I believe they are $50 a person. And before we go, tell us, we never got to talk about this, but it is not the first barbecue. No, it is not. Governor Donald Russell uh, in 1963 had the first barbecue at the Governor's Mansion, and it caused quite a stir because he invited all South Carolinians, and about 100 black Carolinians showed up, and the state's newspapers, particularly the state, made a big deal about that and not necessarily favorably because this was in the middle of the civil rights movement but it was a very gutsy thing that governor russell did and the right thing to have done so tonight we have another barbecue and we assume that people will be having lots of fun at the barbecue tonight enjoying 14 kinds of south carolina barbecue yes there's nothing like it it sounds good well thank you for being with us today i'm katherine reynolds with dr walter edgar for South Carolina Educational Television and Radio, we now join our programming already in progress.